So there was a bug in System D Resolve D, which is the DNS resolver portion of System D, which is a core element of modern Linux distributions. System D is one of the most important processes with most of the Linux distros. It's a kind of a process which monitors, you know, bringing up services and bringing down the services. Basically what it is, is in parsing a result from a DNS request, that response, there was a bug in how it handled the different lengths of memory to allocate. Mm -hmm. Without going too deep, basically, if you, if you could control a malicious DNS server and have them respond back and say, you're gonna to need to allocate this certain amount of data, uh, certain values would actually cause it to miscalculate and allocate a small amount of memory when a large one was actually needed. For example, let's say, if a crafted message has been sent uh, for 4,000 bytes, uh, but the system uh, actually responds with 4096 bytes because uh, of the buffer size. The extra water, the difference in the byte size that can be used for, you know, for malicious purposes. That could be used for one thing, crashing the system. And the second thing is, you know, you can, the hacker can actually inject some malicious code to get the privileges. Basically what the bug allows you to do is take control of the system by returning a specially crafted DNS response. Uh, in response to a DNS query. It's your classic, you know, out of bounds, buffer overflow kind of attack. Correct. So you can write into memory and either crash it, or if you do it correctly, you can take control of the system. Yeah, that makes sense because in a DNA, you know, basically, it runs with elevated privileges. Yep. So obviously you wanna get the, you know, power user privileges. Yeah, so this is a pretty neat bug. Uh, and it seems to be in all versions of system D up to 2.3.3. Okay. Um, as to which, um, Linux distributions are actually vulnerable. It's mm -hmm. kind of a, a mixed bag. Okay. Uh, Red Hat and CentOS have said they're not. Uh, Ubuntu and Debian appear to be vulnerable. And it also requires that you're actually running the system D resolve D DNS resolver and not all versions of Ubuntu and Debian you're doing that too. That's so it. It, if you're running Linux, it's worth looking into this bug mm -hmm. to kind of understand what your exposure might be. Uh, but just be aware that it might take a little more research because even from my, my digging into this, I wasn't quite clear on who was vulnerable and who was not. But if you can, go to wherever your distro provider is and ask them. They'll be able to answer that question for you. But this bug is easy to fix with the available patches, right? That's yes. what my understanding. I believe there is a patch out at this point. Okay. So that's, that's good news. What do you think, Mike? Well, I'm curious because I'm thinking about the exploitation vectors, right? So in the event that I am somebody who has managed to gain access to a gateway or otherwise establish myself uh, or a system under my control as a gateway to intercept communications, uh, you know, I could then respond back with fraudulent um, or, you know, fake malicious uh, DNS uh, requests or responses, rather, um, to maybe be able to exploit this. Um, but that would be a, a fairly tall challenge to, to do, I think, across the Internet. From a local, uh, local malicious insider land perspective, you know, there's, you know, quite a few ways to, to do that that are, that are fairly well known. Um, but doing it, you know, at a distance, I think, would be uh, an interesting use case to get more information about. That is a good point. And I'm thinking about it now because the way that DNS works is if your direct server, your first hop server doesn't have the answer, it'll ask somebody else. Right. So depending on where the attacker is, are they actually going to have a chance of exploiting you all the way up at the top of that chain, or they, is their payload going to try and bump up against whoever it is that it's handling for them? You know, it could be three or four different servers in the way. And theoretically, you could combine that with denial of service attacks, depending upon where you were, right? So if you, you know, denied service to the original um, or, or the initial responder because you compromised the secondary, you know, can can you leverage that as part of that attack as well? Yeah, good questions, all of them. I should have the answers. So, Matt, you know, just to wrap it up, I think a good practice is like, a, you know, like a no to, no to have access, like a don't give you an excessive privileges to the users, those kind of uh, no, thing I, might help this bug. I what do think, you think? I think at this point it's really a matter of patching. I don't patching. think any individual user on the system is going to have any ability to defend themselves against this. Okay. So it's really up to the admin to make sure that the patch is in place. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. So always the, keep up with the patches and uh, you're good to go with this uh, specific bug. I think so. The good thing is that there are patches available up there, you know. When you have a good patching and update process, these sort of things will be have very minimal impact. That's the key takeaway from it. 
The quick lesson is patch your stuff. I guess never trust the client is another good one because it seems like whatever value was being provided in that response was being trusted somehow by the DNS client system D resolve D. If I've got input, does it match what I've already been told to expect about it? Are there any values that a malicious person might provide to me that would make my program behave in unexpected ways? That's just general good practice. That's probably where this bug came from in the first place. Hi, Mike. Uh, I heard you're going to talk about the outdated software applications and the you know, recent report came out. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more about that? Yeah. So Synopsys recently released the State of Software Composition uh, 2017. And as part of this study, they took a look at 128,000 applications. And based on their research, what they found was that about 45% of third-party components it studied had, uh, you know, were, were old um, inside of these um, software packages. Mm -hmm. um, these are things like embedded web servers, you know, open SSH, things like that, um, that are combined uh, with other software code to create products in many, many cases. They found that, um, that 45% of these components were over four years old meaning that there were newer and more secure versions available that had not actually made it into uh, the larger product that they were a part of. It's a huge number. Uh, basically, you know, there could be so, so many components in, you know, in the software development cycle. And what that means is you may be writing code as a developer and relying on somebody else's code, and you can do a great job of keeping bugs out of your own code, but if you rely on somebody else's code, you also have to make sure you're using the latest version of what they've got because there may have been bugs that were patched in that code. The report covered software across a variety of environments, right? And they looked at stuff in the mobile space, desktop, web applications. They even went down into the firmware and embedded software um, from a range of industries uh, to take a look at that. And throughout that 128,000 applications they looked at, they found just under 17,000 unique versions of open source and commercial software components that were in these applications, and they found over 10,000, uh, or approximately 10,000 vulnerabilities. Uh, Heartbleed um, certainly uh, appeared in the top 50% of the vulnerabilities that they found, and that's a vulnerability that was discovered in April of 2014. Um, but the oldest CVEs that they found that were still unpatched dated all the way back to 1999. Hmm. Um, so this is a really significant problem when you start looking at, um, you know, the supply chain of software, um, you know, because as a um, engineering student in school, you know, we were always taught, you know, to do that build versus buy uh, kind of uh, cost justification for any kind of a project. And when you start looking at, you know, software development, you know, why recreate the wheel? You're going to reach out and use uh, publicly available libraries. You're going to use those third-party software components rather than re recreate them from scratch. And what that ends up being is, you know, it saves you time to market. It makes, you know, your products more competitive and all those types of things. But from an end consumer perspective, you may end up having vulnerable instances of software packages and services in your environment that you're not aware of. And that can be a real challenge to enterprise security. Okay, that's interesting stuff. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to find old libraries in embedded systems for sure, but um, it's kind of interesting because now you're, you're talking about products that have a, their own life cycle, but because they rely on, and like you, you could guess at how many different packages they actually rely upon, it's not just a matter of patching and making the changes in your own code, it's, it's keeping tabs on every other library that you rely on and any libraries that they happen to rely on and, and so forth and ad nauseum knowing exactly which components are in every single piece of software you're running in your company and which of them are in what state of, of patching, you know, that's, that's a huge effort in itself. There is a trickle-down uh, that occurs, but depending upon the vendor or the platform or whether or not you're running up-to-date uh, code or hardware or what have you, um, you may be falling outside of that sort of waterfall kind of update model that goes from, you know, component manufacturers through product vendors down to the end user. Interesting. One comment I would make is most of the times, you know, folks, you know, update the process. Once you update, they think they're good for, you know, some time. 
that process of updating should be ongoing. As mm -hmm. you know, Mike said, you know, it should be the owners and the, you know, admins are the owners of the specific applications. Mm -hmm. You have to keep up, you know, going back. This process is, uh, you know, okay today. It may be vulnerable tomorrow. A program which may not have a vulnerability today may have some vulnerability coming up tomorrow, or maybe in a week after from today. But it's always good to have a good process of you know, updating the processes and libraries, updating it. This points out a real kind of blind spot, I think, in a lot of organizations where software life cycle really isn't um, something that a lot of organizations, uh, I think, really have at the top of their, their radar. You know, hardware life cycle is pretty easy to do. Things mm -hmm. like, you know, Microsoft, you know, end of licing a product, that's you know, it's pretty, pretty blatant. Um, but for other instances, you know, I don't think that organizations are really keeping track of those types of things very well. So what's the solution? I mean, what do you think is the solution? You know, I don't think there's an easy answer to this one. I think it's something that, you know, we have to, uh, as security professionals, be cognizant of and really open better dialogue with our vendors and say, look, you know, I realize that you're selling me a firewall, but I need you to tell me what are the components. Because if I find, you know, if there's a, you know, Tomcat, you know, vulnerability or something that comes out um, or some other, you know, type of component level vulnerability, I need to go back to my equipment vendors and say, hey, does this impact you? And what version of code do I need to upgrade to in order to resolve that issue inside of my environment? And I think that it becomes a bit of a push and a pull uh, kind of strategy where the component vendors really need to push those updates, you know, in as timely a fashion as they can down to, um, you know, product vendors, and then as consumers, I think we need to pull uh, on those on those vendors to get them to be more responsive um, and kind of prioritize some of those updates. In this case, again, you know, uh, general security practices will come into play. For example, even if it's not related to software packages, if you have good detection systems. There's other ways that you can protect a system than by fixing bugs. You may be able to add something into the system that prevents an entire class of bug. So rather than trying to account for all the different versions of all the different modules in your software, you may be able to approach it from a different perspective, which might be the most uh, reasonable way to do it. If you make some change, it may break something else. Yep. I mean, it's kind of, you know, you have to figure it out, the fine balance between, you know, keeping up security and you know, the balance how to do this. Let's take a look at the internet weather for this week, Anesh. Sure. So uh, the top 10 most probe ports, again, that's the number of probes that are occurring on the network and not the number of sources probing. Mm -hmm. uh, 23 TCP, Telnet still in charge here. And we have seen 22, 23 ports, which are you know, always uh, up for you know, looking for uh, IoT kind of devices. 1433 is, I want to say, uh, MS SQL Server. Right, that's right. And that one's been up there for a while. It's still kind of interesting. I'm not really sure why it's there. Somebody has a definite interest in it, but who knows? AD TCP is always somewhere in the top 10. That's your general web ports. So port 1900 UDP, that's uh, UPnP or SSDP. Mm -hmm. um, 3389 is RDP, Remote Desktop Protocol. Yeah. So that's interesting. Uh, port 445 is SMB, which... There's no surprise right now. Not a surprise <laughs> at all. Really not. Kind of a tragedy, actually. 445 TCP, which is SMB port, which is up in the top three now because due to ongoing, you know, malware and ransomware attacks, you know, it's kind of not a surprise to see end up in the top five. 445 has been up there for the last month because of the WannaCry, Petya, and other worms that are using the Eternal Blue exploit. Uh, so I expect that to last for as long as the population is still vulnerable. Port 9000, uh, I believe, is re related to a specific IoT vulnerability that we've been observing. Uh, port 443 is HTTPS. Mm -hmm. Again, not a, too much of a surprise. Those web ports have plenty of vulnerabilities to go around. And then we have 123 UDP, which is NTP. NTP, so yeah. So that's always an interesting one to see as well. Uh, let's go to the most sources probing. Um, 23 is, again, at the top of the list. No change from last week. Mm -hmm. 445. Increased. Um, that's increased by one, but again, we talked that it's SMB. Yeah. And again, there's no surprise for that being of interest these days with the, the WannaCry and Petra worms. Um, port 22 TCP is SSH, still to the top. 81 TCP has been there for a while, and that one's kind of interesting too. That's like an alternate web port. Yeah. Uh, I believe there was a specific bit of malware that scans for I think uh, Perseria. Perseria, that's the one, yep. I think uh, that's, uh, that uses this specific port. Mm -hmm. 
Port 80 TCP we've talked about. Uh, we'll skip over the ICMP ones. Um, 6881 is BitTorrent. BitTorrent, yeah. Which is kind of an interesting one to see. I'm never quite sure if that's somebody who's scanning for BitTorrent hosts or just the, the traffic of the BitTorrent network because by nature, it's like one host talking to a whole bunch of other ones. Mm -hmm. So it may show up in our algorithm as a scanning attempt because of the, the one-to-many relationship. Port 8080 TCP is an alternate web port as well. Um, 21 TCP is FTP. Mm -hmm. and we have another ICMP one, which isn't really of, of note. So we'll go to port 23 TCP. Scan sources on this are actually stabilizing, I want to say, over the last couple of weeks. They were, we've seen much, much higher volume um, overall, but yeah. still, still at the top, regardless of the, whether it's climbing or, or going down, it still is, is king by far. Uh, you can see little patterns there. You can see probably a daily cycle of scanning in each one of those little graph selections. I think there. that definitely shows uh, some sort of you know out of the nature of scanning. Absolutely, yeah, I agree with you. It's interesting. I'd like to. I tend to think that those little bumps are some you know single focused action, okay. and the rest of that baseline is a mix of other ones. So, but. Whoever that, that tiny segment of the graph is, is not a huge amount of, of source IP addresses. Mm -hmm. So probably around uh, 5,000. I guess that's still a significant number. Significant number, in yeah. Terms of, yeah. I mean, if you're comparing with 110,000, 5,000 is a minuscule. Yeah. But 5,000 is a huge it's number big, as yeah. it is. It's yeah. a significant botnet. Cool. 445 TCP we've been talking about for, wow, probably a couple months now, ever since WannaCry came out. Still a port of interest. Uh, you can see over here uh, in, uh, in May, I believe that was the uh, WannaCry outbreak is that spike. Uh, but you can see that we've grown past that initial spike and the, the scanning on 445 now. The daily changes, like that might be a single botnet there of one, two, three. Oh, wow, that's, that's like 6,000 scan sources cycling. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one group of machines that are under single control, I assume. So that's really serious. I mean, it's it's higher than it's ever been. We're we're peaking out around twenty seven thousand scan sources per hour wow. here. Those are a lot. It's a lot. That's because Eternal Blue and Double Pulse are pretty serious vulnerabilities. They 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 work. So I mean, I, also the the ransomware things going on around. You know, they're one way or other looking for the SMBV one, which is uh, four four five. Yep, it's true. All right, port eighty one TCP you mentioned before was Purser I, and we okay. saw a huge spike of that in May. Um, and it's been up and down, but really now it's sort of leveled out. I want to say around eight to ten thousand scan sources um, per hour. So yeah, I guess maybe we've we've hit the saturation point on this this botnet. Who knows? Maybe it's just not growing anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but this, like we said, it's uh, Perseri. It attacks webcams. Webcams. So. I think still it's in the top ten. Yeah. True. Yeah. Uh, port nine thousand TCP. We saw this this hit somewhere towards the end of May. And it's sort of been trending downward since then. We think it's a particular brand of the vulnerable DVR. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it had its day, and it's certainly much higher than it ever used to be. I mean, you can see down at the start of May, you had almost negligible, always under, I'm going to go with like, probably a couple, like couple, couple uh, hundred thousand. That's a oh, million, actually, isn't it? E to the six? Yeah. I should, I should remember this. Even then, it was less than, you know, 10 million, but now we're, we're somewhere in the range of, I'm going to go with 80, 80 million scan flows uh, per hour. And 1433, we, we keep talking about, I'm still not really sure what they're, they're looking for specifically here. I mean, mm -hmm. if there's a vulnerability uh, in SQL, I haven't heard about it. So uh, who knows? Somebody knows something more than we do. We had a nice downward trend um, from the start of the month, a little bump here around and the, the 29th. Up, yeah, during the weekend, long weekend, just the start of the weekend, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, probably there might be, you know, some sort of, you know, attack vector. Somebody might have found it. Mm -hmm. Or it could just be they have a bunch of default passwords. Default passwords, as well. yeah. I mean, that's a viable way of attacking these services as well. Yeah. And that's that. We need to have a multi-layer defense approach. As the theme goes, you know, keep patching, good backups, uh, good security hygiene. In general, being prepared is and and taking care of as much as you can in advance of a crisis is a lot better than being stuck in the middle of an incident and having to run around and, and take care of everything at once. Uh, I guess the Boy Scouts say be prepared, do it. <laughs>